You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. It had been being tossed about in the North Atlantic storm for over a week. The canvas sails had been ripped and torn and tattered by the wind. The wood along one side of the ship had been busted to pieces and in splinters and in some places stripped entirely off the boat. The crew held out little hope for survival at all. And after 11 days, sailor John Newton was so exhausted from bailing and working the pumps, even though they didn't expect to survive, that he simply couldn't work the pumps any longer. And they tied him up to the steering wheel, and he stood there from 1 o'clock until midnight trying to keep the boat on its course. And in those hours, he had plenty of time to think about all kinds of things. He thought about his own life and how it had become a wreck, much like that ship. Sailors are not known for their refinement. They're not known for their manners, and they're not known for their good language. But John Newton had acquired a reputation that would make even the most hardened sailor blush. To his acquaintances, he was known as the great blasphemer. He had acquired a reputation for his debauchery, his profanity, his depravity, his cruelty. And he was aboard a ship that traded slaves. He was a slave abuser. And he had sunk so low that at one point in his life he was actually a servant to slaves. And there he stood at the mast guiding the ship and his thoughts geared toward his life and the wreck that it had become. And his thoughts also went back to the words that his mother had told him as a child. You see, his mother had died when he was 11. By the time he was 13, he had been out at sea with his father. And he lived on the sea from then on. Um, his mother had prayed that her son would someday become a minister of the gospel. And he remembered the words that his mother had taught him and the scriptures that she had taught him, and those flooded back to his mind, and he thought on those. And after that storm was over, he went and he found a New Testament, and he started reading from it. On that day, March 21st, 1748, John Newton trusted Christ for salvation. He would later write of that day in a journal, On that day the Lord sent from on high and delivered me out of the deep waters. Later, John Newton would give up the slave trade and he would become a, a, a minister of the gospel in London at St. Mary Woolnook. And from there, he would influence missionaries like William Carey and Henry Martin and even William Wilberforce, who was a, a member of parliament and who led the abolitionist movement of his day in, in England. John Newton had an influence on him. He has an influence on us because we sing the words that all of us can identify with. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. He never got over the grace of God in his life. Even later in his life, he remarked to some of his friends, he said, my memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. On his epitaph, which he himself wrote, it says this, John Newton, clerk, Once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the gospel he had long labored to destroy. Can you think of another person that those words could be used to describe? Sure you can. Saul of Tarsus. Listen to his own words in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost of sinners... Jesus Christ might demonstrate His perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in Him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. First Timothy chapter 1. It's John Newton's story. Saul of Tarsus' story. 
It's our story. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were cleansed. You were justified in the name of our God and in the spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. John Newton was a transformed man. You see, I believe that saving grace is a transforming grace. I believe that the grace of God that saves has such far-reaching effects in the life of an individual that you cannot be saved without being transformed. John Newton was transformed from a reviling, blaspheming, debauched, profane, cruel, Christ-hating slave trader into a minister of the gospel. Saul of Tarsus was transformed from a persecutor and a violent aggressor into the Apostle to the Gentiles, author of two-thirds of our New Testament. It's transforming grace. It amazes me that Christians can speak of someone being saved without being changed. As if a person can be saved without ever be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. As if a person can be redeemed having never had their heart of stone replaced with a heart of flesh. As if somebody can be saved and not be delivered from sin and indwelt by the Spirit and produce the fruits of righteousness and holiness in their lives. We talk about people believing and praying a prayer and being saved. No evidence whatsoever. We still think they're saved. Friends, saving grace is a transforming grace entirely. I do not believe that you can be saved and not be changed. Because he who begins a good work in you will complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. And he will continue that work in you, saving you, sanctifying you. Because the same grace that takes sinners and makes them saints takes saints and makes them servants. That's the grace of God. It is a transforming grace. We looked last week at the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, as he's known in Acts chapter 9, and how he was changed on the road to Damascus. Friends, he went to Damascus and he was not expecting to see Christ. He didn't go there to meet Jesus. He was not traveling that road expecting at any minute for the Lord to appear to him, but the Lord did. And when he got up from the road and the light had faded and the voice had faded, Saul of Tarsus was a different man. Who art thou, Lord? And he knew. But then he said, Lord, what shall I do? And Jesus said, go into the city. It will be told you what you're going to do. And he was commissioned as an apostle. He was a transformed man. And it's evident in two things. Because Luke not only tells us about how Saul got saved, and that he was baptized, and, and what happened surrounding that, but beginning in verse 19 through basically verse 31, Luke tells us what happened to Saul after his salvation, his transformation. And we're going to look at verses 19b, uh, halfway through verse 19, through the end of verse 22 this morning. And I want you to see his complete and total transformation is evidenced in two things. First, his fellowship with the saints. And second, his service to the Savior. Read verse 19 of Acts chapter 9. Paul took food and he was strengthened. And now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is not this he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by, that, by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. First of all, you notice his fellowship with the saints. Verse 19 says, Saul, for several days, was with the disciples at Damascus. Now, a question that kind of comes up, and it's a good one to sort of um, contemplate a little bit. What happened to the men who were traveling with Saul? Remember back up earlier in the passage, she was coming into Damascus, and there were some people with him. They saw the light. They heard the noise. They didn't see the person or hear the voice, but they saw light and heard noise. What happened to those men? Well, they ended up leading him by the hand into Damascus because Saul was blinded. But what happened after that? Who were these men? I mentioned last week, likely that they were temple guard. People sent by the high priest with Saul in order to round up and persecute, arrest, and bring back to Jerusalem these believers. And now they've come into Damascus. Where would they go? What happened to them? Well, mission's over, right? 
Saul's approaching Damascus with an extradition order in his hand. He sees the light. He hears the voice. He's a changed man. He goes in, doesn't eat or sleep for three days. He's at the house of Judas until he's commissioned as an apostle by Ananias and the laying on of his hands. What happened to the men who traveled with him? They went back to Jerusalem. Likely. Can you imagine what happened? His cohort of temple guard come into Jerusalem. No Saul of Tarsus. No Christians in tow. What did they tell the chief priest? What happened? You're never going to believe this, Caiaphas. But we were approaching the city of Damascus. We were following Saul. About noonday, we're just, the city is in view. The sun is high in the air. It's hot. But man, there was a light that you can't imagine brighter than the noonday sun. And you should have seen Saul of Tarsus hit the ground. He was on his face quicker than anything. We could hear a, a noise. We could see the light, but we couldn't understand what was being said. But Saul was talking with this light which was coming from the heavens. And when he got up, he was a changed man. He was blinded for one, and we had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. And we took him to the house of Judas where he had arranged to stay. And he was there, and he said, mission over, forget it, go back to Jerusalem. Here's the extradition order, I'm done. And now we've come back here. Now with all that the chief priests have had to deal with in Jerusalem, with Peter and James and John and the rest of the apostles, this could not have been welcome news. No Christians? No Saul of Tarsus? What other information do you have for us? Well, you're going to see next week, friends, they wanted to kill Paul after that happened. They wanted his head. And they were after him because he was a changed man. He was with the disciples at Damascus. Saul stayed there. He didn't go back to Jerusalem. He didn't leave anywhere right away. The text says, Luke tells us, he was with the disciples at Damascus. Now don't read over that too quickly because that's a loaded phrase. That speaks volumes about Paul. Paul didn't get saved and go off into the wilderness. Paul didn't get saved and then go hang out with the temple guard. Paul didn't get saved and then go back to his old friends and go back to Jerusalem and hang out with the chief priests and the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and all the people who were part of his former circle. He didn't do any of that. What did he do? He stayed with the disciples who were at Damascus. These were the people that three days earlier, he had had a a written warrant for their life, basically. And he was coming here because he hated them. And now all of that hatred that he has has been turned to love. He's with the disciples at Damascus. That is beautiful. Saul does not for one minute think that he can be part of the body of Christ and be a Lone Ranger Christian. From day one, Saul was with the saints. Friends, i I got to tell you, I think that there's a serious spiritual problem with people who can go long periods of time claiming to be a believer and never attend church. There's got to be a spiritual problem with people who can claim to love Christ but not love His church that He gave His blood for. There's a problem with somebody who says that they love the Lord and are saved and are a child of God but have no desire whatsoever for fellowship with other believers. Not so with Paul. From the time he got up on the road to Damascus until his dying day, his life was about one thing, other believers. He lived for others, ministered to others. He was with others. He was with believers constantly, serving the body and serving other people. All the time he was. That was his life. Because Christ was his new Lord, his people were now Saul's people. Their God was Saul's God now. And he was with them from day one, with the disciples. And he had a love for these people. Listen, three days earlier, he didn't have anything but hatred for them. Breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He was on his way into Damascus. It didn't take Saul months to get over his hatred for other Christians. It didn't take Saul months to get over his his disdain and his wrath toward them and start getting a desire to love them. The natural evidence in the heart of Saul was that he had a love for the brethren and he was with those disciples. Wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else. John says, how do we know that we've passed from death to life? Because we what? We love the brethren. How do you know that Saul has been a transformed man? Who is he with? The very people that days earlier he had hated. Now he loves them. And he's with the disciples at Damascus. And friends, it also speaks volume of the disciples at Damascus, doesn't it? It tells you more about those people than it does really about Saul. Here was the man who days earlier had wanted what? Their death. And now he's with those disciples. Now that had to have been hard for some of them. But there is love demonstrated by the apostle, by Saul. 
And there is forgiveness demonstrated by the Christians. Some of those believers were in Damascus because Saul had been successful in ravaging the church in Jerusalem. He had broken up that fellowship and those people had scattered. Everybody but the apostles, they were scattered all over. And some of those people were in Damascus because they were running from his reach. And now can you imagine him being introduced in the church? You gather for a Sunday morning worship service and you're there in somebody's home and in walks Saul of Tarsus. <gasps> you're kidding. What do you do? You want to melt into the couch. Hope that the cushions fold over you and you become non-existent. I hope I'm wearing something that blends in with the walls. And they introduce him. Here's Saul of Tarsus. And Saul tells a story. He's with the disciples now. You see, the Judaism had lost one of its greatest minds and greatest men, and Christianity had acquired it. And they recognized that. And he was with the disciples that were at Damascus. This is the man that had overseen the death of Stephen. This is the man that had caused so much pain and suffering to the saints in Jerusalem. And the church forgives him. They welcome him in. He comes in and he is with them, fellowshipping together, eating together, breaking bread and worshiping. Can you imagine worshiping with Saddam Hussein sitting right in front? Bit of a distraction for you, you think? Bit of a distraction? Here's Saul of Tarsus in the church at Damascus. And Ananias really had set the tone and led when he walked in and he laid hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord that appeared to you on the road has sent me to you. And he commissioned him. And from that day forward, Saul was with the disciples speaks volumes about their love, their forgiveness for him. Second thing we notice is not only Saul's presence with the disciples, his fellowship with the disciples, but second, I want you to notice his service to the Savior. His service to the Savior. Verse 19 ends with him in Damascus. Verse 20, immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues. Immediately. Immediately. Uh, Friends, how are you in forgiving people? When Saul came into the fellowship there, would you have said to him, Saul, I understand Jesus has forgiven you, but you have to understand you've caused me a lot of pain, and you've caused my family a lot of pain, and I think it would be a good idea if you found another church to worship in. I understand I'm supposed to love you, and believe me, with the love of God I love you, but that doesn't mean that I like you, so why don't you find your way out the door to some other fellowship? These people readily forgave Saul, and second, immediately it says, he went into service. Immediately, he began to preach Christ in the synagogues. He could have put forth a myriad of excuses for not immediately serving the Lord. Some of them you've maybe given or heard. Lord, I'm too busy tent making to serve you. I don't have time to do that. But he doesn't do that. He goes into the synagogue immediately. Lord, I'm a brand new believer. I don't even know what my spiritual gift is yet. So I'm just going to sit here in the pew until I find out what my spiritual gift is. And until you appear to me again and tell me what to do or write it in the sky, I'm going to wait upon you. It sounds spiritual. It's actually pathetic. He could have said that. He could have said, Lord, I was just blinded. I didn't see for three days and I had scales fall from my eyes. That was a traumatic event. I need some time to get centered. could have said that. He could have offered all kinds of excuses. He didn't. What did he do? Well, Saul was sent to the synagogues. He went to the synagogues. He went to the synagogues. He had been sent there with the extradition order to the synagogues who were in Damascus. And he went to the synagogues and began to preach and to proclaim. That is what Ananias had commissioned him to do. Ananias had told him, Saul, the Lord appeared to you to make you a witness to all men. Christ had told him on the road, for this reason I have appeared to you. Get up on your feet. You're going to be a witness for me of all that you've seen and heard and of other things that I will yet reveal to you. And so Saul did that. Immediately, he goes into the synagogues and he begins to preach to them Jesus. Now, you've imagined what it's like for the Christians to be sitting in a house church and Saul of Tarsus walks in, humbled. Imagine what it's like to be sitting as a Christian-hating Jew in the synagogues and Saul of Tarsus walks in. You think, yeah, here's our guy. Here's our man. We've heard about him. He came from Jerusalem. He has permission to round up all these nuisance Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem for punishment. And Saul walks in, and what are they expecting him to do? 
They're expecting him to unfold for them his extradition order and begin to read. By order of Caiaphas, the high priest, all of those who belong to the way are hereby ordered to submit to arrest and go back to Jerusalem in order to be punished for blaspheme. That's what they're expecting to hear. But he doesn't come in and unroll an extradition order from the high priest. What does he do? Instead, he comes in and as became his custom for the rest of his life, he would go into the synagogues and open to them the Scriptures and begin to preach to them Jesus. What must that have looked like? Saul of Tarsus, the one who came here to persecute the way, is now preaching the way. And the Jews had to have sat there and said to themselves, which Luke says that they did, is this not he who was in Jerusalem just a few days ago and persecuted those who belonged to this movement? And now here here he is, Preaching the faith he once sought to destroy. What a change! That would have caused jaws to drop in the synagogue. Saul of Tarsus, you're now proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah? Not only that, but look what Luke says. He was arguing with them saying, He is the Son of God. That's a, that's a, a, a claim to deity. When the high priest at the trial of Jesus said, I adjure you by the living God, tell us whether or not you're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him what? You've said it yourself. And they tore their clothes and said, Blaspheme! Blaspheme! You've heard it with your own ears. What further need of witnesses do we have? And they crucified Him for claiming to be the Son of God. And it was the claim that Christ was the Son of God that stuck in the craw of the Apostle Paul until he got up from the road in Damascus. And he had come to Jerusalem to persecute them and put them to death for that blaspheme. And now he's preaching what just days earlier would have been for him blaspheme. He is the Son of God. And Luke says they were amazed. You notice that? They were amazed. You bet they were amazed. Amazed at his transformation. Amazed to hear this man preach what just days earlier he had persecuted. And they had heard that he was coming. Remember when the Lord spoke to Ananias? He said, Ananias, I want you to go to the street called Straight. Find the house of Judas. Go in there. Lay your hands on a man named Saul of Tarsus. What did Ananias say? Lord, I've heard about this man. How much pain he caused to your saints in Jerusalem. And now he's here with authority to bind all those who call on your name. His reputation has preceded him. News that he was coming with that authority had traveled to Damascus faster than Saul could. And they were expecting it. And then when he comes into the synagogues, commissioned by a different high priest and an authority other than Caiaphas, with a totally different message, they're amazed. Saul, are you kidding me? What did you say? How can you say that? They couldn't believe they were hearing these words roll off of his lips. He's a transformed man. He now preaches the gospel that he once labored to destroy. Total change. And it says that he confounded the Jews who were at Damascus because he continued to increase in spiritual strength. And he confounded them. What do you mean confounded them? Well, he goes into the synagogues and he opens up the Old Testament and he begins to preach Jesus to them and debate with them and argue with them from the Scriptures and he's confounding the Jews. All of those in the synagogues who had opposed Christianity were right with him all the way up to the road on Damascus. They wanted Saul to come into Damascus and round up these believers and and they were in favor of everything he was coming to do. And now he's arguing with them. These who had been on his side just a few days earlier, and he's confounding them. Remember what it said of Stephen? When he publicly debated those who opposed him, they could not refute the wisdom and the spirit with which he argued. Now here's Saul doing the exact same thing. The Lord took Stephen and he gave us Saul. And Saul picked up where Stephen left off. And he argued with them and they could not refute him. They say, how is that possible? How is it that the Apostle Paul, how is it that Saul of Tarsus could go from a persecutor to a preacher in just a few days' time? And that he could actually have the wisdom and the knowledge and the ability to preach and to debate and to to offer a defense and to argue and, and debate with these people and win? How could he be so effective so soon? It didn't take years of study. He went into the synagogues and they couldn't argue with him. You know why that is? Three reasons. First, because he was an apostle. I mean, look, he's got giftedness and spiritual capacity and powers that you and I can only hope to have. That's just Saul of Tarsus. He was an apostle by calling, a spokesman for Christ. 
Second of all, he had heard Stephen's defense. Saul had likely heard Peter's defense and John's defense. He had likely heard the Christians arguing and debating these things in Jerusalem. As he persecuted the other Christians and they had opportunities to give their defense, he had likely heard them give their defense. All of that exposition of the Old Testament that Stephen had given, Saul was there for that. He was familiar with their arguments. He was familiar with the text that they would use. He had heard all of that. But third, Saul of Tarsus was a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee trained by Gamaliel. There was nobody that could be put up against him that could even hope to have the mind, the talent, the brilliance, or the understanding of the Old Testament that he had. And once he had come to understand who Christ was, that was the key that opened up the whole Old Testament for him. All of a sudden he could see the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. He could see the good shepherd of Psalm 23. He could see the sufferer on the cross in Psalm 22. He could see the reigning king of glory in Psalm 24. All of that Saul could see now. His understanding and grasp of the Old Testament, it was second to none, but now he had the key that gave it, just unlocked it for him. And now he could understand who Christ was and see him in every chapter of the Old Testament. So you take his natural brilliance, his phenomenal mind, his training, which was second to none, his grasp of the Old Testament, which was unparalleled in its time, his training under Gamaliel, and you couple that with the Spirit of God and the power of God and his spiritual giftedness, forget it. You're going to try and argue against that. You're going to find a different opponent. Because he'll take you down every time. And he did. He confounded him. And he just grew in strength in doing that. And he was tremendously effective. Folks, I want you to see something here that we learned from the life of the Apostle Paul. We'll close with this. When God saves us, He transforms us. But there's something that happens in that transforming, and it is this. He has a way of taking all of our undesirable characteristics away from us. And He has a way of leaving and enhancing and using the desirable characteristics that we have. Saul had a lot of undesirable characteristics. Hate, rebellion, pride, arrogance, self-confidence, hostility, a hard heart, a stubborn mind. And when he was transformed, those things were gone. The, the hatred was turned to love before he ever got up out of the dirt outside of Damascus. His undesirable characteristics were changed. The Lord takes some of those away from us immediately. Others, he spends a lifetime refining those and taking those from us as he continues to sanctify us. But the second thing that the Lord does, not only does he take away the undesirable characteristics that we have, but he leaves and enhances and uses some of the desirable characteristics. And all of us, even as pagans, have desirable characteristics. What were some of Saul's desirable traits? Did he have any? Sure he did. He's aggressive. He was a self-starter. He was motivated. He was tenacious. He was brilliant. He was articulate. He was passionate. Saul was one of those type of people that when he believed something, friends, he would fight to the death for it. That's why he persecuted Christians. Saul was one of those people that, that if something was wrong, he would fight against it to the death. If something was right, he stood up for it to the death. Saul was one of those people who everything he did, he threw his whole heart, his whole soul, his whole mind, his whole strength into it until it was accomplished. And he'd see it through to the end. He was tenacious. He was persevering. He was aggressive. You didn't have to tell him twice. He was the type of person that when something needed to be done, he did it. And he did it with excellence. And he did it all the way to the end as well as he could do it. As passionately as he could do it. No excuses. No substitutes. Nothing but the best. That was Saul of Tarsus. That's why he had a reputation for persecuting Christians. Because when he set about to do it, he didn't just approach it like it was a hobby. It was his life's drive. And from the moment he got up on the road of Damascus, he was the same type of person. But now he could say, this one thing I do, I press on toward the goal of the high calling of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. This one thing I do, and his whole missionary effort, his whole life was this story. He did it all the way to the end and he kept going and you couldn't stop him. And finally they took his head off. This is the only way you could shut him up. Because that's the type of person he was. And the Lord used it and he was effective in it. Because in Saul of Tarsus there were these undesirable things that the Lord begins to grind off of him. 
through the course of his life. And all that is desirable, the Lord takes that and he channels it and he uses it. Friends, you and I are vessels that the Lord uses. He uses our makeup. He uses our personality, our character. He uses the traits that are part of us that we are. All those things that are desirable, the Lord takes and he commissions those and he uses them to his service and to his glory. But there's one caveat. It's in that second question. See, Saul had asked the first question, who are you, Lord? That's the question you ask at the moment of salvation. And you understand he's the Savior, he's the Redeemer, he's the God of creation who is the lover of your soul and came and offered himself on a cross for you. And you trust in him as Lord and as Savior. But there's that second question. What shall I do, Lord? See, the first is the question of salvation. The second is the question of service. Saul said, who are you, Lord? And he knew. And he was transformed. And immediately from his lips, the second question, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'll serve you. That's the question of service. Friends, have you yielded yourself to be a vessel and an instrument in the hand of God and to serve him? Or are you content resting on your laurels, waiting for the Lord to speak to you, reveal himself to you, come back, or whatever it is? Have you yielded yourself to him? And have you asked him, Lord, what shall I do? What do you want me to do for you? You name it, and I'll do it. That's what made Saul effective. We see his his total transformation in his fellowship with the saints and his service to the Savior. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you that you not only save us, but that you commission us to serve us. You not only give us the opportunity, but also the privilege of serving you. And it is indeed a service to see, a privilege to see you use us and to channel us as vessels through which you can minister to others. And I would pray, Father, that you would remind us once again this morning from this text of how important it is to immediately begin to obey you. Having asked the question, who are you, Lord? We've come to the Savior, and now I pray, Father, that you would turn us as saints into servants. By your grace and for your glory, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.